Let's now move on to um, uh, to Chris. Uh, Yes, Chris Moose of the LSC, and his talk is on the fox, the hen house, and the one who let him in, in the religious far right and its enablers in higher education. Now, that's a splendid title. So, Chris, over to you. Thank you, Rami. So, uh, thanks, first of all, to Aliyah for this um, great talk and very shocking talk about the f state of the education system here in Britain. Um, I think many of the things that I will say will be less surprising to you after hearing what Alia has just said about faith goals, because I'm going to talk about the role of the religious right in higher education. So the very idea of higher education makes universities the natural venues of initiation into secular and pluralistic life for many adolescents, whether they are from religious or non-religious backgrounds. So you would think. In the next 10 minutes, I'll endeavour to explain how universities and student organisations have, however, abdicated their duty to provide this environment to students, working instead to perpetuate and extend the influence of the religious far right, rather than challenging it. I submit that this betrayal of secular principles will have profound consequences in the decades to come. In preparation for this, I invite you to place yourself in the shoes of a religious student arriving at university, if you are a first-year undergrad at my university, the London School of Economics, you will have a read a brochure promising that you will be challenged intellectually, socially and personally. But you are about to realise that you have been exempted from these challenges by those who patronisingly presume, without consulting you, that you are too delicate to face them. You will soon discover that in the brave new world of education as commodity, the great unwritten clause of your student agreement is that your deepest prejudices will be left untouched in the name of inclusiveness. And should you be so foolish as to attempt to be progressive and open-minded yourself, you will find that all the attention and reward is lavished instead on those who stick to the bigotry and chauvinism of the riches for right and its enablers. How did things come to pass? I will start with the parable of the fox and the hen house, starting with the religious right. For decades, racist and nationalist organizations have been confronted, fought, and marginalized within British universities and student organizations. At the same time, the religious far right has gone largely unchallenged. While many religious organizations on campus do not, or at least not openly, pursue a far right agenda, the rhetoric and actions of a high number of them are typical of the far right. Here, I will first explain the role of religious student societies. On British university campuses, many Islamic student societies discourage what they call gender free mixing. In some universities, Muslim sisters will even have their own society and only communicate with the brothers via email, not in person. Some Christian student societies completely ban women from speaking or allow them to speak only when accompanied by a husband. Muslim students are ordered not to talk to white, non-Muslim women, as they are prostitutes. Openly gay Muslim students are told they are not Muslim and that they deserve to die. In public events, ushers make men and women enter the lecture theatre through different entrances. Women are to sit at the back, or at least in a separate area from the male audience, and I have lived, seen that myself and been subjected to that kind of treatment. Minority students like Shia and Ahmadiyya Muslims are harassed by other students who call them infidels, order them not to call themselves Muslims, and detain them from using the Islamic prayer rooms. At the same time, Christians openly seek positions of power within students' unions, unions in order to bring a Christian influence into decision-making. They say that quite openly. In the efforts, religious student societies can count, obviously, on the support of larger and well-funded organizations of the religious far right. Most Islamic student societies are part of FOSIS, the Federation of Student Islamic Societies. FOSIS claims to be the voice of 115,000 Muslim students and has the declared aim of fostering and protecting the interests of Islam. FOSIS requires the members to maintain segregation between brothers and sisters, keeping interaction between them at a minimum. That is a direct quote. Hosts events with far-right speakers, including Assam Tamini, who supports suicide bombing, and people like Anwar Avlaki, an Al-Qaeda recruiter described as key inspiration for 9-11 and other attacks. 
FOSIS is, however, not the only far-right group active on campus. With dozens of speaking engagements in the last two years, the Greek convert, Hamza Tsotsis, is the so-called Islamic Education and Research Academy's main speaker, and you say that Islamists don't have a sense of humor, one of the most popular guests of Islamic student societies. Tsotsis advocates making homosexuality a crime, calls for the death penalty for apostasy and blasphemy through painless beheading, advocates pedophilia and child rape, and instructs very precisely when and how to do that, claims that we as Muslims reject the idea of freedom of speech and even the idea of freedom. Sources is also a former member of his Hisporteir, an organization banned in several European countries for its rabid anti-Semitism and misogyny, but is still allowed to openly target students on UK university campuses despite being no platformed by the National Union of Students. The second most popular speaker is Haitham al-Haddad, who encourages female general motivation. Constance that for Muslims, hating Jews and Christians is a necessity. Proclaims the blood of ex-Muslim uh, apostates as halal. That means it is okay to kill them. And defends suicide bombing, wife beating, and the stoning of women for adultery and fornication. Sources and al Haddad have also been speaking at events organized by the aforementioned FOSIS and are only two of dozens of speakers of the religious far right that are re regularly welcomed at British universities. So, of course, when we see how the religious right open so freely and openly on British university campuses, the question of the one who let him in, and here I'm making perhaps a grammatical mistake because English is not my native language, but um, I've been told it should be it, the fox is it. However, you know, as you will see, the one who, you know, does perpetrate these acts is mostly male, so that's actually quite befitting. So, the student representatives of the National Union of Students, the NUS, has explicitly rejected perils of religious organizations with far-right groups, claiming that political attacks on mainstream Muslim organizations making perils with the BNP are unfounded no matter how fascist they really are. According to the NUS, FOSIS, despite being a prominent organizer of events on campus featuring hate speakers, remains part of the solution, not of the problem. Given this open defense of organizations who work against women's rights, the adv advocacy of student representatives of gender segregation at universities is not quite surpri surprising. The NUS has declared it fu fully supports our guidance condoning imposed gender segregation at universities that Pragna Patel has been speaking about earlier. The SOAS University Muslim, Muslim Christian Dialogue Society has advocated both segregated and mixed seating in any event. And uh, these are the moderates. The Women's Officer of King's College Students Union has even demanded that gender segregation should be respected, if not tolerated, in institutions of higher education as it was firm to the principles of Islam. These are an argument, a valid argument that a student representative these days can make, apparently. So sadly, feminist student organizations have remained completely silent on the issue of gender segregation. An explanation for this is that the religious far right has already gained positions of influence in both students' unions and the NUS. Consequently, representatives shy away from countering the influence of the religious right, even in the face of obvious discrimination. I've just actually been told yesterday um, that, and that actually fits very nicely with what Peter Tetzel said about Kobane, the Kurdish resistance IS. This week, there was a motion of support against IS at the National Union of Students. It was rejected. It was rejected because it was said to be Islamophobic, <laughs> and the NUS executives expressed great pleasure that part of the Western racist narrative about ISIS, ISIS in quotes, um, has been challenged. Rather than countering the previously described illiberal tendencies in the student bodies, universities are equally guilty of pandering to the religious far right in the guise of respecting the religious identities, beliefs, and practices of our fellow students as it is the practice at my 
University, the London School of Economics. For example, at University College London, we can see what happens when religious beliefs are respected at all costs. Here, far-right speakers have been and are a regular occurrence on campus, and the underwear bomber, so-called underwear bomber, and former president of the UCL Islamic Society has been convicted of the attempted murder of 289 people. Evidence of other current or former students killing or attempting to kill for religious reasons exists of graduates from the universities of Leicester, Luton, Brighton, Glasgow Metropolitan, London School of Economics again, King's College, Westminster, Brunel and Greenwich. Quite an impressive list. Nevertheless, Malcolm Grant, the Vice Provost of UCL, has stated that radicalization on campus is a non-issue. It just doesn't exist. A reason for this might be that as students have become consumers, universities are eager to cater to the alleged need for the protection of their religious sensitivities. As doing God is seen as doing good, universities are heavily funding interfaith initiatives at the expense of other non-religious political and cultural offerings. Consequently, universities have not shied away from limiting freedom of expression whenever it serves the inclusiveness, so-called purpose. So one of the results of that has been that non-religious students, like myself, who appear to fall out outside of the gender, are excluded, disadvantaged, denounced, harassed, banned, threatened with expulsion, physically removed for offending religious sensitivities. Apostates appear particularly challenged the idea of interfaith. With the support of the London School of Economics, student representatives has, have gone so far as to stop the formation of an ex-Muslim student group as that would be offensive to Muslims. <laughs> the official explanation. So, um, ways forward, going back to our student from the introduction, we can see how she is, be, she is going to be left alone in facing the fox of the religious far right. While those who should oppose the fox are not only not fighting him, but preparing the ground for him to prosper and thrive. In the context of an anti-secular, multi-faithist government, that promotes sectarianism along faith lines, there remains less and less opportunity in the UK to have an education outside of the reach of the religious far right. As my friend and fellow activist Abhishek Fatnes has put it aptly, the soul of British higher education is slipping through secular fingers, yet it perpetually seems only one brave administrator or one morally normal student leftist away from restoration. Given the situation, I will outline quickly how what can be done to address the problem of the fox and the one who let him in. Secularism and human rights must prevail over multifaithism. Tackling the extremism of the religious far right requires not only addressing the symptoms but also the root causes that allow it to grow and prosper. Universities need to become secular spaces where religious and non-religious students can develop alike as giving privilege to religious students amounts to treating students differently on the basis of their beliefs, universities need to adhere to the principles of strict secular neutrality. Second, beware of false liberalism and relativism. Tolerance ends where intolerance starts. Particularly public institutions must not give platforms to groups or individuals that agitate against human rights and equality. Moral and cultural relativism cannot be an excuse for inaction in the face of the religious far right. Groups who promote homophobia, chauvinism, misogyny or violence must not be given an opportunity to prey on the young and impressionable, regardless of whether they do it in the name of religion or not. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. It's a very sad, I mean, I know as an academic, it's a very sad tale to see the National Union of Students plunging such depths. It, it really is, uh, it, 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 it beggars belief. Just a quota to that, but the universities are also very keen now with cuts in education of recruiting overseas students, so they want to be very welcoming. That means we will look after your cultural and religious interests and sensitivities. So bear, bear in mind what's, what's happening in universities. We, sh we should be paragons of free speech, as A.C. Grayling said in his brilliant speech, you know, critical, analytical thinking, challenging 
nonsensical ideas, the importance of evidence, argument, reason, you know. The, what's happened to the NUS is, is, is nothing short of a tragedy.